There is a proud tradition at AFI Fest, and that is to hand the programming reins to a guest artistic director. And in years past, that honor has been fulfilled by visionary artists like David Lynch and Agnes Varda and Pedro Amadovar. And this year, we wished to continue that proud tradition, and so we wished upon a star. And she said yes. <laughs> we are very proud that years ago, we at AFI Fest celebrated her and her very first film here at the film festival, a film called I Will Follow. Yeah. And we have, like you, followed her ever since. We're, a few years later, we were also very proud to say that she received a thunderous standing ovation when she gave the keynote address at AFI's Directing Workshop for Women. And then, a few years after that, we were even prouder to present the world premiere of Selma. And, and there she was, sitting between David Ayelowo and Oprah Winfrey, and I thought, this is like a Mount Rushmore moment. And it continues to echo on through time. Now, we are proud to say that she is a trustee of the American Film Institute, helping us lead the way. And even more exciting for us, all here in the room, she's here today. Writer, director, producer, force of nature when we need her most, Ava DuVernay. Thank you. It's always uh, wonderful to see folks, and so thank you for being here, and thank you, Bob. The big dog came to introduce this. He has a whole festival, give him a hand, uh, a whole festival to work on and came to be here. Um, this festival means a lot to me. He outlined why. Um, I'm an a Angelino. Uh, uh, this is my hometown. And so uh, this festival uh, was one that I really wanted uh, to show my early films um, and, and, and to be selected for. And the relationship has continued. And so this invitation to be the artistic director um, allowed me the opportunity to program three films. And, so, and three women came to mind immediately. Three women who have inspired me, and I think inspired is kind of like a dead word because everybody uses it so much, but like truly to catapult your imagination into new places, that's what inspiration is to me, and these women have done that for me. We all made films early on in our careers at the same time between, in the 2000 teens, and we were all coming out with our films at that time and crossing each other on film festival circuits and watching each other's films, and uh, they continue to be in my life, and I've tried to be in their lives there friends of mine, they are, um, they are uh, inspirations of mine, as I said. And so this conversation is not a moderator talking to someone they don't know. This is a moderator talking to people, women who she loves and, um, and want you to know and love as well. So we shall begin first with, I mean, she's just so cool. I don't even know how to say it. Um, she's made a beautiful film that uh, years ago that we are uh, uh, unspooling again here at the festival. Uh, and uh, another LA film. Uh, it is called Mosquita Imari, and her name is Aurora Guerrero. Come on up. Madame. Thank you. This is a lady who I, I kind of liken as one of my most unlikely collaborators. I do not know if you put the two of us together, and, no, if you put the two of us on opposite ends of a spectrum, you like say she belongs there and she belongs there, and yet we hold hands in the middle. I learned so much about, from her. Um, she's opened and expanded my imagination about all kinds of things, particularly about white folk. And I'll say this, really, really, her film was the first film that I ever watched and saw kinship 
in, um, in the poor white folks of the South in line with some of the philosophies of Dr. King um, and, uh, and, and SNCC to say, and Fred Hampton to say, this is a shared struggle. She wasn't, even, I don't even think she was trying to do it. But she showed me something in the films that she was making that made me recognize myself and people I knew, and I think that's what pa films do best. It's powerful. And uh, the film that we're showing of hers at the festival today is Hellion, and her name is Kat Candler. Come on, Kat Candler. Hey. <laughs> hey. There she is. And this next lady is someone who, um, she, just, she just dazzles. Wherever she walks in, she's just a gem that dazzles you. Um, and I've had the opportunity to get to know her as a friend, as a sister. Uh, she's someone who is a bedrock of, uh, of uh, um, I don't know, fire uh, in all of the best ways. And uh, she burns bright. She burns hot. Uh, the film that we are uh, sharing of hers is called Yelling to the Sky. If you haven't seen it, uh, be around tonight for a spectacular uh, directorial debut of uh, the outstanding and dazzling uh, Victoria Mahoney. Come on up. There she is. Okay, great. Well, now I gotta move this. Like, okay, I, I'll do. Uh, okay, now you need your water. See, this is what happens when you get four directors together. Don't have us go get a meal. Chairs will be moved. You're in the wrong light. Let's move it this way. It's it's a lot. Um, I want to start um, by asking each of you to introduce and share what you know and love about another one of us in this group. Ah, the shock, I got him already. <laughs> it's yes. such a good question. So, uh, Arora Guerrero. Great opener. Si. Can you please share um, the first time you met and your uh, associations with, your feelings about, uh, and your connection to uh, Kat Candler? Cat. Wow. So <clears throat> I met Kat on the set of Queen Sugar. Yes. Uh, I knew of Kat's work because Kat is a superstar. Um, and I already looked up to her because of her film that I hope you all come to see tonight. And, um, and she was my producing director. I don't know if you know what that means, but basically she's uh, keeping all the directors in line with the vision of the show and championing the directors. And that's what I loved about Kat, is that I felt, because I didn't know what a producing director was, um, but through her, I learned that they have my back. They want me to succeed. They um, are there at every, you know, whatever block comes up, whatever roadblock comes up. Uh, she, in particular, because not all producing directors do this, I learned too. Um, she was there to help me um, figure figure it out. But really, it was just, um, there's just a connection between me and Kat that's very deep because Kat and I like roll really hard now. <laughs> Everywhere. Um, she's a gentle spirit. Um, she treats everybody with so much respect and compassion and love. Um, she's super smart. And... Um, and I just adore her. So that's, that's how I met Kat, and that's who she is to me. That's Guerrero, Guerrero on Candler. We <laughs> like that. We like that. Yes, yes. Um, um, Victoria, can you talk a little bit about Aurora Guerrero? Um, I can't remember, actually, the very first time we met. I don't know if you do. I do. Oh, I remember because it was a uh, it was a Sundance Women in Film thing that they threw. Yes, and you were in the <laughs> you were in the back complaining. Yeah. Yeah, complaining yeah. sounds right. No, no. <laughs> yes, the accuracy. Uh, Let's, Rightfully don't, so, don't though. Say Rightfully the, don't so. Say the long story. One sentence. Say a little bit why. No, because uh, you know they're they're 
the space historically, many spaces within this industry tend to be very um, white centric. Even if there we may have been the only two people of color there, <laughs> is what she's saying. And so we were in the back, and I was like, you know, whatever. You walk into space, which is of course why why we um, why we have a deep affinity for Ava and what she's done for each of us. But it was I was in the back. I was a little shell shocked. I thought this is a friendly space, and this is the space that they're telling us we're going to change the world. And we walked in, and I was just like, where are the rest of us? Because we go a lot of places where there aren't us, and we're used to it. But there, I was like, oh, so that's what I was saying to them. Would you like me to help you find some more people like us? Because I, I can do that happily. And then I got Aurora's number and I would randomly check in on her and we bonded through secret night phone calls that we still haven't had maybe nine days ago when I first came home and I called, checked both of them and we, you know, we, uh, we have phone calls in the night that you can't have with other people and these, the, the thing about um, Aurora and I is uh, we have a very s similar uh, vernacular that we can't always use on set. So, <laughs> so we can be free with each other in ways that it's, um, you know, there's a lot of code switching at work. And so um, you come home tired from code switching and you want to be able to call someone and just say, you know, I can't believe what the fuck I got, can you, then what? And then, and that could be something great and exciting, but you can't always say that in the workplace because people don't know that New Yorkers say certain words with joy and excitement is not a bad thing. So, um, and and then I believe you know she was going through something specific, and I had a little bit of understanding in the ways that we all sort of reach back. And the only sanity and safety and grace and real ease I have in my day to day is if I stop whatever madness and whatever challenges I'm going through and I reach back to someone and say, how's your day and do you need anything? And are your reps doing what they need to be doing? Do you have food in your table? Do you have gas in your car? You know, stuff like that. And um, and uh, so so that's how we started phoning and that's how we still phone. And, and Aurora is incredibly talented. She walks her talk, and I'm inspired frequently, quietly, and loudly by her. Thank you. And Kat Candler, can you tell us what you know about Victoria Mahoney? Yes. So it was South by yeah. Southwest year... Two. Billy Mulligan, are you here? Oh. Billy Mulligan! <laughs> yes! So I met Billy Mulligan long, long ago. Um, and he was producing Vic's film at South By, and I, I'm assuming you emailed me, and was like, we have this film playing. I was like, okay, I'm coming, I'll be there. And I showed up, and I, like, every frame was beautifully relentless, and just, like, it's heart, and it's just, like, pounding off the screen, and I'm, and then Vic gets up to do the Q&A afterwards, and like, oh my god, there's this supermodel who's just like fierce and badass and like so stylish and cool, and I just follow- Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but just following her through her career, and then first season of Queen Sugar, you were, I think, a few episodes before me, and I remember seeing your frames and being so inspired, it was just like, art in every single corner of the frame. And I remember you the photography books that you reference, the photographers that you reference. It was just like art is just oozing out of your body and just beautifully put to the screen. And I've just always been in awe of the art, the human, the supporter, the champion, the friend. And it's, I, I think, what's so just in awe of this, these friendships that have been built through film, through art, um, through excitement of each other's work, and you just find like the heart and the deep connections with all of us that just transcends and continues. And I hope that's happening for a lot of you guys as you look to your right, look to your left on set, and see the people that inspire you, because those will be the people that you continue to work with for years, five years, 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, you know, who knows? And that. That's what I love about what we do. Thank you. Thank all three of you. So any uh, emerging filmmakers out there, I just, you know, one of the through lines in all of their answers and all of their introductions were film festivals. Um, they're, they're so, so key 
you know, that's where you meet the folks that are going to propel you, inspire you. Um, you know, it's not even just on your set. It is, you know, this is where filmmakers congregate from around the world in different places, and that's where you really connect with people outside of your circle and expand your circle. Uh, so I would just encourage you, if you're here, you're at a film festival, to connect, to talk to folks, whether you have a film in the festival or not. These are the spaces, these are our sacred spaces as filmmakers, and so congratulations to AFI. This is, I think, their first time open back in theaters since uh, COVID, is that right, Bob? Uh, so uh, congratulations, it's not easy to put it up. Let's give them a hand, uh, and happy to be here. Happy to be here. Um, so one of the things that they all kind of said that they have in common and that we all four have in common is Queen Sugar. Queen Sugar is a television show. Um, anybody in here know about Queen Sugar? <laughs> a few. You have to ask because it really is niche, you know. Folks who love it don't think of it as niche, but it is really niche. I can talk to people about seven seasons of my show, Queen Sugar, and uh, in certain rooms in this industry, people will be like, you have a show called Queen Sugar? What network is, you know, like no, no clue. Um, but yet this is a show that looms large, especially in, uh, in the black community. Um, it is um, won every award you can win from black people. Um, but, but, but we, you know, but, but those awards are not seen as, as valuable as, uh, as awards given by other bodies. And so, um, you know, we feel like we are the hot stuff, even though half the country doesn't know we exist. <laughs> um, but I would encourage you um, to start to look outside of uh, your window a little bit and look around and find voices and stories and places that introduce you to people and voices and places that you may not, that may not be on the path right in front of you. Queen Sugar is one of those for many people. Um, so anyway, we had a mandate, a mission, a mantra that we only uh, would hire women directors. And at the time seven, thank you, at the time seven years ago, the whole thing was, well, there aren't enough to actually staff a whole show. I was like, oh yeah, no, I know enough. I know a whole bunch of women. I see them on the film festival circuit all the time. It's like, yeah, but they haven't done television. I was like, but they've made films. They've made actual whole films, not this episode of television. What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> but that was the prevailing thought was that if you had not made an episode of television, then you would not be hired to make an episode of television. So how do you ever make an episode of television? <laughs> right? Especially if you're a woman, especially if you're of color, those doors, those opportunities, those, oh, just let them in, let them try, we're not open. Queen Sugar was um, the first show that it had in the history of television, um, uh, ongoing series that had an all-women directorial team for seven seasons. Um, <laughs> 42, 42 of those directors, uh, their episode of Queen Sugar was their first ever episode of television. And those women have gone on to direct um, every show that you watch. <laughs> for real, for real. Bridgerton, Lovecraft Country, what's the one Amanda does with the, with the family doing crack in the um, Oz Ozark. Um, <laughs> see, I said family doing crack and you guys thought of some black folk. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. Every show, every show you can think of, network, streaming, every single network. Um, we've had some big events and some big coverage and they've just pages and pages of all the shows that these women have gone on to do that they would not have done if they didn't have the opportunity. With that said, before we go on to delving into your craft and your films, I wanna talk a little bit about your experience on Queen Sugar and, and mainly the sisterhood of the all women directorial team, uh, what that felt like because it's so odd and not normal. Um, and as you've gone on to direct in other places, what have you taken with you from that unique environment? Any lessons from that unique environment? Kat, uh, I'll start with Kat. Kat um, is um, a, a unicorn. I mean, because she's a writer, director, producer, and she is the only episodic director who became the producing director and the showrunner. Um, for how many seasons? Were you from end to end? Three, oh, uh, four seasons total. End to end, yeah. So went from episodic director to producing director to showrunner. Um, thoughts? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as the sisterhood goes, I think what was so magical was stepping onto set the first season. And actually, it, I, I came to visit. I was in New Orleans um, scouting for something, and 
I think I reached out to Ava, I was like, I'm here, can I come visit? And um, So Young Kim was directing her episode, and I was there, I think Sally Richardson might have been there, and I was just hanging out and watching and, and feeling the vibe. And I didn't know television, I'd never been on a TV set, I'd never been on a really big set outside of my little indie films. But what was so beautiful is it, it felt like those indie films. It felt like, you know, your, your ragtag group of friends that you're gonna get together and you're gonna make something really cool and really special. And it had that kind of homemade feel to it that I think really comes to the screen and feels like people's hands are touching every everything, every frame. Um, and the people, I think what's so, truly great about this show is I saw people season one, um, PAs, ADs, who I then saw in season seven, same, same crew rising through the ranks. Now they're directing episodes. Now they're the first AD from the key PA. It was that I, I don't think happens. I think that's a rare, a rare gift to a crew. Um, to a team, to a family, because tr it truly was a family, and that came off of the set into our personal lives as we continued beyond Queen Sugar to hang out, to swap scripts, to go to each other's screenings, to workshop each other's stuff, um, just hang out over a glass of wine when I don't even really drink, but I will <laughs> with these guys. Um, That's basically Victoria getting Cat Candler drunk. <laughs> That's what this, the story being told. <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think that familial atmosphere is a big part of it, and and so I think you know as we continue down, like what pieces of of, of that experience have you taken with you into other places, Aurora? I mean, I I so uh, I mean, what you created is is um, is very unique. It is the unicorn in the industry. It, it's. Uh, I don't often experience it, unfortunately, but I I try to find it. Like I'm very particular about uh, not just the content, but who's who's the boss, who's you know who's in your position, and what are they? What are their values? What do they believe in? Because it trickles down, right? So I am looking for folks that have you know some values that are in line with mine that want me on their show. You know that I'm not just a number or just someone to turn it over, but I'm. It's not that I'm looking for family, but I'm just I'm looking. That those are the environments where I thrive. Mm -hmm. You know, so I want to always do my best work. So I I look for those groups. So when I interview, that's what I'm. I'm interviewing them for sure, mm -hmm. and I ask them about these things. Mm -hmm. So. I look for that. I look to try to recreate what you did on Queen Sugar, basically. Well, first of all, I don't even know why you have to do an interview because you're so incredible, but we'll <laughs> talk about that later. But the one thing she said that I will just say to any ed, in, uh, emerging filmmakers out there is when you're in an interview, remember you're interviewing them too. So that's a big, a big, big deal. Um, Vic, what about you? What do you take with you from Sugar? Um, well, of course, I echo what um, what Kat and Aurora said because uh, it's really rare. And so what's interesting, it's a unique scenario because you step into it. And for a lot of us, it was our first in TV and it set the bar. And then you go to other places and you just sort of <laughs> um, there's a shell shock, to speak quite frankly. And um, the sense of community, and you know, when we were on Queen Sugar, that you feel this is what you feel. So if I would, any person next to you, put your hand on on your back, or the last time anyone in your life has put their hand on your back, especially on your heart side, and just held you, not said anything, not tried to fix you, not tried to um, ease what you're going through, not tried to solve you or, or rescue you or fix you or save you, they just put your hand on your back, and you know they're with you. And really, that's all we need. It's that times 100. It's every person on the crew. So you, you, there's not one person who's trying to cut you at your <laughs> back or you know, smiling in your face and saying some shit behind you and undermining you with crew when, you're inter when they're interviewing to come work for you and it's their dream job and someone is in a meeting telling them something about you that um, is underscoring your leadership and all the weird shit you hear about that's brutal and nasty and real and every goddamn day. Like, it's happening every day. 
there was none of that to the point that I remember being on the set the, uh, one of my first days and Antonio, who's a DP. Antonio Cavacci, our DP Antonio, is here. he was here for all of us. And, shout out. and just a true collaborator. And we were in a tiny space and I was trying to see something and I cr climbed over a balcony and I probably looked like I'd fall. No one said, you know, it wasn't like, I, I wasn't doing anything stupid. But it was it was just sort of going around. I had to get in this spot and I got in there and we did it. And then Antonio's like, hang on and get me the lens. And we like just figuring out, but these sort of things you got to do to get a shot that it's like, no, it's over there. No, I got to go under the chair and around the woods and through my grandmother's house to get that fucking shot. And everyone was just like, oh, let me see. And that night, Paul Garns, who I have sent notes, but I don't think he believes me, Paul Garns sent me an email that said, God damn it. I'm trying to always be like this hard-ass New Yorker. And then <laughs> Paul sent me an email that night when anyone else would have said, you're crazy, you're pushing too hard, your um you want too big your big your wants are too big paul said i see that you came here to win and we're going to help you and that is a thread that runs through the entire queen sugar front to back the staff and i mean it, it, you know there's no echelon which is another thing, you know, you know, this thing, I grew up in film, I came up, I'm crew first, crew to the day I die. And, you know, people treat certain individuals on a set like this one's more important and that one's less important. And I'm always like, yeah, <laughs> when we're standing outside with millions and millions of dollars burning and the lights going out of the sky and the person with the thread for the button comes running over and that button will screw us all, they're the most important person on set at that minute, at that hour, in that scene, in that sequence. And Queen Sugar taught us to stay ourselves. And that's the thing, is other places try to break you. And Queen Sugar said, sing, fly, and soar. Hey. Well, that feels good to hear. Uh, so if you haven't, haven't watched Queen Sugar, it is a show on OWN. <laughs> Um, it is in its seventh season and its final season. We have four more episodes left, and I just want to take this moment to thank all of you for what you gave to that show. I couldn't have done it. Couldn't have pulled it off. We wouldn't have got as far as we did, so thank you uh, so, so much. You. So this is the thing we're going to do now. Um, this is a speed round to prepare you and get you excited for all of the films by these women who are showing tonight. You got some tears. I see people wiping tears up in here. I mean, dang, very nice. We love it. Always love a tear. You know, I like to bring a tear out of my work. Every time, they ain't crying, I ain't happy. <laughs> um, but, but um, so speed round, okay? Speed round. So Mosquita Imadi, Hellion, and Yelling to the Sky, the, 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 the early films of these dynamic uh, directors are playing uh, tonight um, all across the festival uh, here in this theater. And um, we shall begin with speed round. Uh, tell us uh, how your speed round on how you cast the most difficult part of casting. Two minutes go. Casting Smositi oh, Imari. Uh, we went to local high schools in Southeast LA, about five, saw about 300 girls. Uh, I had casting directors also looking at girls. Mosquita Imari, played by Finesse and Venezia, came through the casting directors. But they, Finesse was from Southeast LA, or she is from Southeast LA. Um, and they came in, what I loved about both of them that stood out, they said, I've been waiting for this story and I've been waiting for you. And I was like, okay. So it started there and I put them together and I fell in love with them right away. And I felt like I could push them. I felt like they were gonna allow me to shape them um, for the performance and just to, just to be in the trenches with me. I fell in love with them. They were like my little sisters. So um, I rolled the dice. I was scared because you know the, my film, it rides on their backs, and you never know, you could be wrong, but I was hella right. You were hella right. One of them, <laughs> one of them is here, right? Yeah. You have some cast members here we'd like to acknowledge? You can stand up, Vanessa, and Laura's here too, plays her mom. That's Mosquita and her mom back there. Brava. Southeast LA in the house. 
All, all right, uh, speed round, because they're trying to wrap us, but we ain't yep. going until we finish our speed round. Uh, Kat Candler, <laughs> we got to go fast. Tell yes. us about that cast. A uh, bunch of 14-year-old hell-raising boys in Texas. We went to schools, community centers, a lot of motocross races, because they're motocross kids, and found just these most authentic boys who just felt like they came from like tiny town Texas and just felt so real and authentic, and, um, and they shined. Sure did. That's Hellion. You can see it tonight. And Vic, tell us about Yellow um, Sky. I think probably um, Billy, I don't know. I mean, I think it's probably Billy Mulligan as a producer, as I said, which he didn't start as a producer. He was some um, someone else on the crew, and the film was sinking, and he saved my life. And I bumped him in the middle of filming to producer, and um, and he knows where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> but um, I, I think it was Zoe Kravitz, because we had to find someone who had a youthful component, and I mean in their spirit, a sort of softness and naivete, and um, and then had to play this other part where they harden, and um, so they had to have this innocence fused with a bit of... Um, of um, harshness about life and reality, and there was some stuff in that, you know, that was tricky, and it was the New York thing, and how hard to play that, and and um, and then to just hold that film in that way, and that, you know, I always talked about that role. It wasn't a noisy role; it was like a tea kettle. It was a difficult job because it was someone shutting down, and it's much, you know, it's exciting to play a character or film a character where they're just coming undone, and it's noisy and loud. And it's like, oh my God, that's so much fun to watch a dragon destroy a room and all the lives in the room, but this was like someone who was just quietly numbing to life and then trying to undo that and the damage that comes from it. And Zoe came in and I don't know, like she had a few readings and she, I brought a coach in, an acting coach to work with her in the scene. She outran the acting coach. I was giving them exercises and she was like, no, 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 no. And she, I mean, outpaced the acting coach and we were just like, you know, lightning in a bottle. Thank you. This is a time on a set where as a director, I walk into the set and I say to the actor, come here. And I said, I said, speed round. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all of you, all three, we need to get the, look at this. It's look at what that says. Oh. Put, it down, put it down, put it down, put it down. Don't Cinco. let people see. Don't let Peter people see. Here we go. Speed <laughs> round. <laughs> where do you like to stand on the set at camera? or off camera, close to actors, little behind, go. It depends. Uh. It totally depends. <laughs> on the floor, by the camera, do or die. Yeah. On the floor, by the camera? What does it mean? Floor. If I could be on the floor with the camera right here and a monitor and I, the actors- So right not here. looking at monitor. Uh, no, Let me, I a, sometimes I have a baby at, monitor. You're looking at babies. Are you board. looking at babies? Babies? What's baby that? monitors. Oh, uh, I can't Hand help. Help. I like the big shit. You like, like the big ones? Them. Uh, I like babies. babies so I can be close to actors. Big ones if it's a big, beautiful wife. Got it. The okay. big ones if it's action. Got you. Copy that. Okay. What is the your go-to if an actor's in a jam? Listen, the sun's going down. And it is a day scene. And it is not happening. There's nothing you can say. There's nothing that has been said. They, keep, It's not happening. You got to pull it out of your pocket. You got to make it happen. Vic Mahoney. Oh my God, well, we just had this, of course, on Old Guard 2, and I'm saying, of course, because every job has it. Um, so the go-to is I used it to try to sort of get philosophical in a way that you want to, you don't want to break them out of the character. If it's something emotional, I will go to the producers and just say, we have to breathe here, we have to pause, this is the point of the story, and without this point, there is no story, so we need a little bit of time. If it's a moment where the light's going and you just can't, I will walk up to them and I will say, no joke, you can ask any actor I've ever worked with. I look him in the face and say, we're all grown ups. I'm going to tell you, if we don't get this out in 2.2 seconds, the sun's gone and we're fucked. There you go. Very nice. Cat Candler. Um, I would say I will keep the camera rolling. I never will cut. I will talk to actors while we're rolling, depending on what the scene is and what the emotion is. But I will continue to talk to them and talk to them. And oftentimes, even in crunch time, I'll be like, okay, just play. Just don't worry about anything. Just just go and do your thing and have that comfortable space. Don't worry about the sun that you see <laughs> setting in the sky behind me. Doesn't matter. Just play. 
got it, got it. Aurora. Yeah, it's the same. I, I, I make sure we don't call cut. I just keep rolling. The producers might not like it, but roll, roll, roll. And I'm talking him through it. I'm like, this is what I need. I need you to get her out of the room now. Tell her, tell her off. Yell at her. Do whatever. Do something. Do it or else I'm going to cry. And so <laughs> I, I throw the guilt trip in there. But uh, no, we just, you know, you're just in the trenches. Everybody's like in it to win it. And so it usually pans out. Got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of these. They were fun. Um, I, we, we needed a two-hour session. But let me just say this. Just tell the people, because now they know you. Now they're like, wow, look at these cool chicks. I want to follow them. I want to know them. Uh, tell them what you're doing next and now so that they can become new fans of Aurora Guerrero. What do they do? After they watch Mosquito y Mari, then what? And your episode of Queen Sugar, two of them, then what? Well, um, I, I'm on Instagram, so you can follow me on Instagram, and I often post what I'm directing. I have a show that I'm going to jump on called The Only Only Other Black Girl on Hulu, and then I'm developing two things, a TV series with my friend over here. Uh, that so I'm, good. I'm very excited about. World You Have Not Seen is going to be great, and a feature that I'm also developing. Hope to have those two out by next year. Come on, Adora. Very good. Cat Candler. I can say? Yes. Okay. So tell them, tell them the thing. Like, the thing? Okay. Yeah. So Ava came to me last spring. I was like, I have this, this project. It's, um, I don't know if it's something you'd be interested in, which usually when she says, I don't know if you'd be interested, it's usually like, please, God, I'm in, I'm in. I don't know what it is, but I'm in. So it's this really magical piece uh, for stars with Josh Jackson and Lauren Ridloff. Um, it's untitled. It's the untitled Josh and Lauren project right now. But it's a, a beautiful love story about a white hearing man in small town Texas, an Afro-Latina deaf woman who lives in big town Texas of Austin, and they fall in love, they get married, and they have a kid. There it is. And this is the only time that Array, our company Array, and Paul Garns, when you mentioned Paul Garns as the president of Array, um, uh, president of Array Filmworks, president of Array, Array, Tulane Jones is here. Give a, to give a wave, Tulane. <laughs> give a wave. Um, is um, is uh, the only project that I have ever sold. So I had the idea, we pitched it, multiple bidding war, sold it, and literally had to call someone, or find someone who I was gonna hand a green lit show over to. You don't wanna do that to just anyone. You wanna do that to someone who you love and who's gonna love it back. And this woman has taken that idea. This show is so, I just, I marvel at what you're doing with it every single day. It's gonna be so good. It's gonna come on stars someday, we'll see when. Um, we start shooting next year. Um, Kat, um, not Kat Candler, Victoria Mahoney, what's next for you? Oh, and Kat is on um, um, uh, IG, but she hardly ever goes oh. on. Um, <laughs> and it just says Kat Candler. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm in the editing room um, for Old Guard 2. We just got back um, from many, 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 many months in, um, in Rome. And uh, we're in our fourth week. I guess Monday's our fifth week. I have um, maybe four more weeks before I have to hand in the cut. It's an exciting moment. It's when you sort of rip the film apart and, um, and see how strong it holds. And all the things that you knew were strong are stronger. It's exciting. And some of the things you knew were challenging were challenging. And, and you got to be clever and creative. And it's a really beautiful time. And I love editing so much. I really, really do. I love the collaboration and what comes from it. And then and then I'm going to very carefully pick my next job, and it has to do with what Arada was saying about who you um, spend your hours with and who is, um, you know, who, who, yeah, you know. <laughs> like, it's just a great, exciting thing now, because we're all pushing positions, again, thanks to Ava, who we met basically because the film festival's awful, just for you all to know, is we were both like, and um, we were looking out for each other in festivals, but what, what we all you know have here is um, we are now at a place where we can really be conscientious about who's standing on our right and how to just um, tell the best story that we can for all of you. Thank you so much for coming. We're not done. Um, um, uh, just because she's not being a great publicist for herself right now, Old Guard 2, she said it so fast, but Old Guard was the film that you watched about a year and a half or a couple years ago on Netflix with Charlize Theron kicking the ass and like she's dead, but she's not dead. And like, she's like a dead warrior. What is she, like a ghost? Oh, uh, okay, it's immortal. <laughs> she's immortal, sorry. But dead, but not dead is definitely Sorry, the I'm not good thing. at it. 
She is immortal. She's not a ghost. She's immortal. But she's a badass. And so this is this huge worldwide thing. It was trending for 99 years, number one on Netflix. And, and, and she got Gina Prince Bythewood directed the first one. And who do you give the reins to to do the next bigger, more crazy one? Of course, the dazzler, uh, Victoria Mahoney. And why did they give it to her? Let me just back up. Why did they give it to her? Because they know she can do it. Because she was the first woman director to ever touch a camera in the Star Wars franchise. She was the second year director on Star Wars. All right, that is it. Giving her props. Um, I appreciate you. It's just like you were over our houses listening to us gab. And you were such good friends to sit with, so thank you so much. We hope you enjoy the films if you catch them tonight. And if you don't catch them tonight, they're all streaming. Find them. Support uh, these wonderful directors. And thank you for Wait, being can we just say one last thing about Ava? We have to. This seat has been filled by many, many, many. And Ava... This right here, I'm pretty sure, Bob Wright, this is a historical moment. We all have first, mm -hmm. and um, wherever we go, and it's cool, and pioneering is not for the weak, but it's fucking fun. <laughs> and this is a first that this guest director, it, Ava being the guest director and, and three women filmmakers on the panel, and I just want to say that out loud before we go on about our cushy lives. Yay. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.